for um, this, uh, for your presence, first of all. Um, what I'm going to do now is uh, explain to you that uh, in October 2016, the Libe Committee of the European Parliament asked us, the EPRS, to produce a cost of non-Europe report in the area of freedom, security and justice. And today it's my pleasure to um, present the intermediate results of this research. And I will do so by, now the thing should work, there you go. First highlighting the challenges the EU and its member states face in establishing an area of freedom, security and justice, which from now on I will refer to by its abbreviation AFSJ. Second, discussing the impact of the gaps and barriers in EU action and cooperation in this AFSJ from a individual rights and economic impacts perspective. And third, exploring what we call the untapped potential of the AFSJ. So today I'm also presenting you only some highlights and you will find a more detailed assessment in the background briefing, which hopefully you have found well, on your way in. And I should also mention that this Cost of Non-Europe report um, requires a combined and interdisciplinary effort of in-house and also externalized research. And I would like to thank the colleagues and the external experts that have contributed so far. Two decades after the signature of the Treaty of Amsterdam, the Union and its member states still face major challenges in delivering an area of freedom, security and justice. Problems have been identified in upholding democracy, the rule of law and fundamental rights, ensuring a high level of security in the fight against corruption, organized crime and terrorism, guaranteeing the right to asylum, protecting our external borders and developing a common migration policy. Surveys show that citizens expect the EU and its member states to deliver in these areas, notably in the area of migration and fraud. The intermediate results of our research also show that the gaps and barriers in this EF AFSJ are interlinked. For instance, free movement within the Schengen area has been undermined by the EU's inability to respond properly to the refugee crisis. Effectively fighting corruption is illusory in a state in which the rule of law is not respected. Similarly, lack of action against discrimination and racism and maltreatment in prison undermine efforts in the fight against crime and terrorism. I will now discuss the impacts of these gaps and barriers in some more detail, starting with the cost of non-Schengen, which I've seen several of you have picked up at the entry. So the Schengen Agreements incorporated by the Treaty of Amsterdam are a central tool in enabling free movement throughout the European continent, allowing people to move freely across the borders of participating states. Schengen is one of the major achievements of European integration. However, there are deficiencies in common migration and security policies which were exposed by the refugee crisis, including a common European asylum system which places a disproportionate responsibility on certain member states, and fails to treat refugees humanely, the lack of regular pathways for economic migrants, and gaps in external border controls exploited by terrorists. And these deficiencies have led certain member states to reintroduce internal border controls. Though the scale and duration of these internal border controls has been a matter of constant discussion ever since, there is a threat of these controls taking on a quasi-permanent nature. Our research shows that indefinite suspension of the Schengen area could have an impact on the functioning of the single market. We estimate the indefinite suspension could cost around 100 to 230 billion euro over, two, over a 10 year period. These costs would originate from time delay costs for commuters and tourists, time delays for road freight, and changes in expectations in capital markets. As for the impact in the area of justice and home affairs, the costs linked to the reintroduction of border controls could be up to 20 billion euro in costs for rebuilding border infrastructures and 2 to 4 billion euro in annual costs for guarding those internal borders. It is also important to note that the abolition of border controls has been accompanied by measures to facilitate cross-border police and judicial cooperation, which for instance led to an increase in illicit drugs seizures. The societal benefits of this cooperation could be reversed by a return to permanent border controls between the Schengen states. 
and limits to free movement would further erode citizens' trust in public institutions and the EU. Free movement within the Schengen area requires enhanced cooperation in, in the fight against crime and terrorism. Given their illicit nature, crime and corruption are hard to detect and measure. One can, can however, provide scenarios showing the cost of corruption to the EU economy. Estimated to be between 218 and 282 billion euro annually. This figure is based on the scenario that divides member states into four different groups with similar institutional characteristics and levels of corruption. The scenario analyzes how much countries lose in relative economic terms by failing to reach the level of the best performer within the peer group. Our study also refers to an estimate of the size of illicit markets within the EU, which represents a value of around 110 billion euro. Organized crime and corruption, and this is also important to mention, also entails significant social and political costs. Corruption is associated with more unequal societies, higher levels of organized crime, weaker rule of law, and lower trust in EU institutions. Combating organized crime and corruption is a shared competence of the EU and its member states. A more effective fight against organized crime and corruption could be achieved by a better transposition and enforcement of international EU and EU norms, bridging outstanding legislative gaps, and improving the policy-making process and operational cooperation between national law enforcement authorities. We have estimated that the cost of non-Europe could be around 71 billion euro, not yet taking into account, of course, that making measures at EU level also have their own costs and benefits. Many of the observations just made can be transferred to the area of counterterrorism. Notwithstanding the significant efforts that have been taking place in this area, a number of gaps and barriers in EU action and cooperation can be identified. First, there's a lack of evidence-based policy and lawmaking. And without these, one cannot know whether EU action and cooperation might, was or might be effective. At the same time, there are gaps in democratic accountability and judicial oversight. Second, there are shortcomings in operational cooperation through the various EU databases. There's also a lack of awareness and missed opportunities in terms of the use of EU cooperation tools and coordination possibilities by Europol and Eurojust. Furthermore, action to prevent radicalization and recruitment to terrorism needs to be stepped up. There are and third, there are outstanding operational and legal challenges to the tracking of terrorist finances, financing and criminal justice in cyberspace. In this field, beyond the human costs in terms of deaths and injuries, the impacts of gaps and barriers in EU action can be measured in terms of the impacts on victims and also on potential suspects at individual level. At a um, uh, now I have to improvise because I lost the last sheet. At a, uh, at a, and the economic impact can be measured in terms of investment, public expenditure, consumption, and trade. When we're talking about the fight against terrorism, a number of options to move forward would be a more comprehensive and continuous evaluation of the measures that are proposed and the measures that have been adopted and increased oversight by the European Parliament and national parliaments in line with the new powers they have had since the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty. Also, new ways need to be found to strengthen information exchange, training, uh, and training between law enforcement officials. Thirdly, measures to prevent radicalization, including in prisons, require a reduction of prison overcrowding. You cannot expect people to be de-radicalized if they don't even have a square meter to live on in a cell. It makes sense in a way. At the same time, this needs to go along with further combating racism and xenophobia. In this final slide, I've tried to 
make a picture of the kind of benefits that one can expect by exploring this untapped potential of the area of freedom, security, and justice. This also shows you actually how complex this area really is. The slide, or the, 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 the quadrant on the top, uh, on the bottom right, with the snail moving up, is economic growth. And definitely, in a number of areas, we can see that enhancing our cooperation, for instance, in the area of legal migration, would have net benefits. But another very important element here is that developing the area of freedom, security, and justice would actually allow human rights, which often exist on paper but not in practice, to materialize. And for security to actually be at that high level where we want it to be. The most interesting one, which comes through basically all of the studies, is trust. Because when citizens see the benefits of cooperation in their daily lives, they start trusting the EU more, and therefore I had put that quadrant over there as well. Thank you very much for your attention.